Well, good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? I'm going to push it away just a hair, Lance. I, I got to... I got to get it a little bit away from me because I'm going to, I might, I might get excited and jump off of here or something crazy and you guys wouldn't get to see it. So, all right. So, all right, here we go. You know, we have been studying through this last few weeks about uh, the most important part of our uh, whole Christian faith. And that is the fact that Jesus died for our sins. He died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. And in, 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 in the, the, the celebration of the festivals, that is called Passover. He died for our sins. Unleavened bread, he was buried. And first fruits, he was risen again for our justification. And so uh, there is this 40 day gap now between uh, first fruits and, and, and the uh, 50 days actually between first fruits and, the, and Pentecost. And Pentecost is when we get to celebrate the fact that there is a, the Holy Spirit has come and has uh, blessed the church with his power. And with his strength. And the truth is, as, I, as I've probably said before with you guys, if you look at the Old Testament, that's all about God, the Father. If you look at the Gospels, that's about Jesus Christ. And if you look at the church age, starting in Acts chapter 1, we find the, the, the time of the Holy Spirit. And that's the time we, me and you live in. That's the time we are together and we are uh, one accord, the Bible says. And so I, I'm going to be talking a little bit about during that time of the, of the age of grace, we call it, uh, where we are uh, of wonderfully saved by the fact that we have the, the blood shed by the perfect sacrifice, the blood of the lamb, Jesus Christ. He was buried to prove that he was truly dead because there was an important transaction that took place there. Death had to occur, as I'm going to say again in the sermon, had to occur with to pay for the sin debt that you and I had, someone had to take that debt, and we're going to talk about that. But the thing is, is the bloodshed forgives us of our sins, but the death is what, when he was in the grave, he was absolutely dead. Don't let nobody fool you with this nonsense that goes around that somehow he just swooned or he just, he just um, happened to be a... Uh, asleep during that time. I've heard all kinds of crazy things. The truth is he was dead, 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 dead. And Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by God's power, all three are recorded in scripture that the power come upon him and raised him from the dead. And that gave us victory because of Jesus. It gave victory over death. It gave victory over Satan. He, his doom is there. And now we have this period of, of, I think, introspection when Jesus was actually on the earth preaching and teaching during, those, during that time of of, of 40 days and then he goes back to be with the Lord and then then the church on, on Pentecost on the day of Pentecost you see there's a pattern the day of Passover Jesus died for our sins the day of unleavened bread he was put in the grave the day of first fruits he raised from the dead and the day of Pentecost the Holy Spirit came upon the church and gave the church great power Within, within the church to be able to have that as a, as a gift of the, of the Holy Spirit to us. And so when we get to this time period of gap between, between first fruits and Pentecost, I think it behooves us to spend our time looking at what the grace of God really looks like during this time. And so I want you to go, if you will, to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles in your car there with you, or if you've got a cell phone, flip out your cell phone. There's these really, really great, oh, and, and, and it's also on your, on your bulletin. But listen, cell phones and, I, and iPads are not of the devil, okay? Just so you know, it's okay if you use if you use your phone to read your Bible. Matter of fact, we ought to carry it with us all the time, Amen. 
So what we've got here in, in 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 17, he said, um, and, and he, he has us in there. Let me, I, I told you, didn't I, that I was going to read it out of the ESV, and it's right there out of the King James. So let me go ahead and switch over. Let me go ahead and, and get you started here. When we look at the scriptures and we see together 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 21, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that we, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Heavenly Father, this morning as we come together and as we pray together, we do so as children of God. And Father, if there is someone here with us uh, either in presence right now or whether they are on Facebook somewhere and they don't know this power of God, they don't realize the, the, what God has done for them, I pray that right now the Holy Spirit would open their eyes and let them see without a doubt what you have done for us through this death of Jesus Christ on the cross and his resurrection. Help us to keep you first in everything we do say and believe in Jesus name. Amen. So we, uh, we are, we come to this idea of uh, my sermon and, and uh, which is entitled what a deal. And uh, I got to kind of explain that to you just a little bit. When I was a young pastor up in Northwest Colorado, I was pastoring a little church uh, in the up in Rangeley, and I was I was in a in a teaching period with a with a, a nursing home. There was a, a group of they called them the swing bed patients, but they were they were is in the hospital, but it was a, a, a one hallway that was that was dedicated to extra nursing for the elderly, and I would go over after church. Church and I would put, present to them just a little Bible study and we'd sing with them and we'd pray with them. And, and then when they went back to their rooms, if any of them really indicated they wanted to talk with somebody, we'd go back with them and talk. And we had a lot of, a lot of cool experiences during that time. But um, I was talking about this doctrine of reconciliation. I was, I was teaching on it and I had been not paying attention, but my, my young daughter, She's probably, I don't know, 10, maybe 12 at the time. She was sitting in, the, in, the, uh, in a chair there beside me. And as I started describing the fact that Jesus on the cross did something for you that you can't, you could. And we were in a position to where because of that, we were now placed into a position to where we have a tendency or a bent, if you will, to sin. And, and therefore, we are guilty whether we've ever uh, actually meant to do anything or not. Sin is, is, the, is that iniquity, the Bible calls it, which separates us from God. God cannot be in the presence of sin. God is holy beyond all measure of holy. God is holy and holiness cannot be defiled by sin. And we, by nature, have that sin in our lives that absolutely separates us from God. You know, I've always said that, and, I, and, and, and we all need to realize that there is a absolute in the sense that there is this sin nature about us, but that we couldn't live holy even if we tried. And yet the Bible says there's a problem. There's good news and bad news. I'm going to start with the bad, bad news. The bad news is, is you're a sinner. And the bad news is, is that separates you from God for an eternity unless something is done. And what Jesus did on the cross is the good news. 
The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, you see, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John 1, 8 through 10 says, If we claim we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we are calling God a liar and showing that his word has no place in our lives. I one time, one, one night I was telling a lady at, at her door, I had, I had gone up to her door and, was, and asked her if she knew for certain that if she were to die right now that she'd go to heaven, that she'd go to heaven or not. And she looked at me and she says, I don't believe you can know. And I said, well, it, it, is, it, it, it is absolutely the, the desire of God that you know. Five, 1 John 5.13 tells us that we can know that we have eternal life. And that that comes through Jesus Christ. And, and as, I, as I was explaining this to her, she, she had come to the, this point. She says, but I'm not a sinner. And I said, you're not a sinner. And she says, no, I've never sinned. I've never sinned against God. And I said, I said, well, here. And I read her the verse that I just read you. And I said, okay, then you can start right now because you just call God a liar. And calling God a liar would be blasphemy. And blasphemy is a sin. So start right there and realize you are a sinner. And she didn't really care for me, and she asked me to move on. But the thing is, is we have to come to that point where we are willing to realize that we are sinners. In, in the, in, in, in the fact is, is until we come to know Christ as our Savior, until we confess that to God and give Him the, the ability in our lives to give us this eternal life through His shed blood and have faith in that blood to forgive us of our sins, then there's absolutely no way that you can be saved because that's part of the deal. Our tendency to sin comes from the fall of Adam. Adam sinned against God, Adam and Eve sinned against God, and from then on, all mankind has been sinners. Romans 5.12 says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death passed to all men because all have sinned. And so we, we realize that Adam, when he sinned in the garden, did more than just blow it himself. He blew it for all the rest of us too. We are sinners because Adam and Eve sinned against God, the very first two, our parents. It then, according to Scripture, passes down through by one man. Sin entered into the world and, and, and death by sin. And so death passes to all men, implies that through the, man, through the man comes the sin nature. Okay, it takes two to tango whenever, you're, whenever you, you have parents, whether they, they're still together or whether they're still alive or whatever. You have parents, you're, uh, according to scripture, it's by that man that sin comes into the world. You say, well, you're stretching it a little bit. Well, I'm going to prove a little bit more here in a minute. I believe in the virgin birth. Don't you? The virgin birth is also vital. And guess what? There was no man in the genealogy of God, of Jesus. God bypassed that man's, that man's DNA. Jesus was not born with a sin nature the way we are. And so in understanding this and in looking at this, I'm not saying Mary was somehow... Um, without sin, because heaven, heaven forbid, we would think that. Because Scripture says that she was just a she was just a, a servant of God. She wasn't she wasn't sinless, and neither was her mother, and neither was anybody else that that uh, was in her lineage. We're all sinners. Jesus was a, was not a sinner, but according to the verses that we started out with here. All of our sins and all of the things that where we sin and come short of the glory of God, as it says in Romans 3.23, that we do it by committing sin against God. And then we also sin by omitting sins of omission. You say, how do you do that? Well, James 4.17 says, remember, it is sin to know that though you ought to do good, you don't do it. And so whenever we look at, at scriptures, we are, it's coming at us from all angles. And the thing is, is that sin has a penalty. The penalty of sin is death. 
And I'm not just talking about the death of, of hitting something on the highway and, and dying in a car accident or, or, or something like that. I'm talking about death eternal. There is a death that never quits. God does not have that in his plan for you. He said that he said that, that when he thinks of you, he thinks of good things for you. He has plans that extend to you for a good life. It does not come into his mind that you would want to enter into an eternal death. But that death can happen, and it can be if you refuse to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so when we look, and my, my iPad just talked to me and said, it's too hot up here. Um, <laughs> that's the wonderful thing about using, using uh, technology. Let me, just, let me just go on with what, uh, with, with what we were saying. There is a truth in knowing that we are sinners, but it doesn't end there. Sin does not happen just because uh, we commit sin. Sin happens because it's all through this world. But you, as a Christian, do not have to have that stigma put on you. You're, the stigma of sin occurs up until it is paid for. Okay? Now then, what did Jesus say on the cross, the very last thing he said? It is finished. Right? And, and what that refers to is an accounting term. Well, so does the word reconciliation. It's an accounting term. When we see that we are reconciled by the power of God, what it is is, is we, have to, we, we, we have this wonderful gift of Jesus Christ on the cross where he is able to, he was able to take all of your sin, 100% of it, all of your sin, and his blood on the cross was the ultimate sacrifice to forgive sin. Matter of fact, I truly believe that the blood of Jesus Christ has been anointed onto the altar of God in heaven, onto the Holy of Holies of in heaven, on the mercy seat of God, which is uh, talked about in, in, in Hebrews chapter 9. And so the, the whole accounting term thing is this. You owed a debt you couldn't possibly pay. And God totaled it up. Matter of fact, he didn't just total it up for you. He totaled it up for the whole world. And Jesus went to the cross to pay for that sin debt for all of us. Now, as for me, and I hope that whenever you say me too, you can honk your horn and let everybody hear. You're saying God died for you too. Jesus Christ died for you. And that sin debt has been paid for you as well. Say amen. amen. So when we get to this point of understanding that God did this transaction for you and for me, he did so and leaves it up to you. He leaves the final decision up to you. God is a God that does not force you to accept his payment. He paid it all. It's paid in full. It's been, it's been tallied up and it is absolutely complete. It has been paid for, and we call that when you take an, uh, what has been what is owed and what has uh, been been put uh, on our account toward that payment. We call that to reconcile a debt. Okay, and I'm going to use Bill Runyon for a minute. Is that all right? I, let's say that I have a debt over here at the co-op. I have a debt that is far beyond my ability to pay. I got stupid and I bought a bunch of tractors and stuff and, and I went over here and I run up a bill for all the, all the, the diesel and all, the, all of the oil and everything and, and my debt to the co-op was worth far more than I could pay. That's my debt, true? It doesn't go away just because I say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I, I won't do it again. No, that don't matter. You, you owe a debt. You don't get out of it just because you're sorry for it. You don't get out of it because there is because it, it was something you didn't intend to do. So Bill, he goes down to the co-op, being the, the good guy that he is, he goes down to the co-op and he says, what does Joe owe? 
And they tally it up and they say, here it is. And he says, okay. And he writes a check and hands it to them. The co-op doesn't care whether I paid it or whether Bill pays it, right? Where's my, where's my co-op guys? <laughs> it doesn't matter. As long as there's money that went on the account in my name and paid that debt, the debt is paid. What Jesus did is reconciled your sin and said, even though you didn't intend to, even though you're sorry for it, even though you desired, you didn't desire to be a, a, a sinner in that manner, it doesn't matter. The truth is, is you are, you owe this debt. And the truth is, it's been paid. You don't owe it anymore. And so we have this, this sin debt that Jesus paid for us. And all you have to do is go in and, and literally say, well, thank you, God. If I were to go in the next week and say, well, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pay $100 down on this. And, 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 and they look at me and say, you don't know anything. What's your response going to be? What's my response going to be? It's going to be thank you. It's going to be gratefulness. It's going to be a receiving of that. And that's what we have to see the, the real thing is with us as a sin debt has been owed. The truth is, is what my little girl was saying, that, saying is true. What a deal. God took everything that you owed in the way of sin and he paid for every bit of it. With his precious blood, the precious blood of God himself. You see, God does not have sin. Have sin. God does not have blood in, in, the, in, in the way to pay for that. So God, from the very foundation of time, said, the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, said, I will give up my place as deity long enough to be born in the very flesh that they are in, and I will, I will live my life, and then I will pay the debt for them, and then I will come back alive, and, re, and, and the resurrection of the dead will fulfill everything. And all of a sudden now, we not only have death, we not only have sin paid for, the death has been given. You see, the Bible's clear. The soul that sinneth, it must die. And so when we, we had to die, but yet Jesus died for us. We had, to, we had to conquer death afterwards. And so Jesus conquered death for us. And so all you and I have to do is say, what a deal. I give, my, I, I give it over to God and I say, thank you, God, for doing that through Jesus Christ, through the bl blood. I have faith in the blood of Jesus that I'm going to be able to have that laid down on my account. And in doing so, we have, a, we have a, a need for us to recognize that that deal was made with, a, with, with, the, with the fact of being able to know that we are somehow going to be able, through faith, to encounter that debt, that that givenness of, of God, that givingness to to be able to know that we have been forgiven of everything, and now we have been given this opportunity for absolute, one hundred percent eternal life. How do we gain eternal life? It's simply through this. Jesus set it up to where once you accept Him as your Savior. You get baptized and you are placed into Christ. That's what that whole picture of baptism is. It is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And when you identify with that, you are then identifying with the very thing that he used to pay your sin debt. And so when we come together to, in, a, in a meeting like this, we are coming together to worship God for that a, that ability for us to know that Jesus was our Savior. God, thank you for that gift. Thank you for the, the fact that your blood was given for my sin. I didn't have the right thing to do to pay for it. I couldn't have paid for it if I tried. Matter of fact, your Bible, your word says that I, if I tried to earn it, it would be nothing except put toward a debt somewhere. It wouldn't gain the complete forgiveness. But since I am not there to have to worry about working, he said, 
Just trust in me and I'll pay it all. And so today I'm asking you, will you please look at your life and say, I know I'm a sinner. I know no matter how much I worried over that or stressed over that or whether I was sad or whether I was all of these things, it has nothing to do with being able to pay it off. Jesus paid that off and I trust Jesus. And when I trust Jesus for that, he, he wipes the sin dead out. Matter of fact, he says he puts us in Christ. And being in Christ is probably the greatest thing I love to meditate on. And that is, is that I am no longer a sinner. I am no longer a man who, who tries I might, can't earn the, 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 the right into the, God's presence. But rather that because of Jesus and because my faith in him, God reconciled me and you that have accepted Christ, reconciled us into the family of God. There's no more have to want to. I tell people all the time, I said, you know, my daughters weren't angels growing up. And they're probably watching me on, on, on this, but that's okay. Listen to this. My daughters were never little angels. They were preacher's kids, just like anybody else's preacher kids. And they got in trouble, just like everybody else. And I got told about it almost every week. Somebody would come and say, did you know what your daughters are doing? And I'd just tell them, yeah, 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 I know. I know what they're doing. But the thing is, is they were, I never kicked them out of the family. You got that? God doesn't kick you out of the family because you blow it. When you blow it, you just tell him about it. My daughters were always taught there was a there was in our in our yard we had a we had a canal that ran just beyond the fence, and whenever the kids were little, it was a spanking offense. And yes, I did believe in spanking. So if you you got a problem with that? Well, talk to God because he, he's the one that come up with it. And so it's, I told them it's a spanking offense to open the gate unless you come and talk to us first. Well, they'd be doing something, they'd be playing, they'd, they'd go up and they'd flip that gate open. And guess what? It's a spanking offense. It doesn't matter whether, they, whether their ball was laying just on the other side or not. And they grew up with that and they knew that that was the way it was supposed to be. You know why? It wasn't, it wasn't for any other reason to, other than to keep them out of a canal. Because before we had that fence, my father-in-law and my wife which is her birthday today. Happy birthday, Becky. But they, but, but my wife and my father-in-law were, were, were uh, building this little uh, pump house right on the edge of that. And we didn't have a yard fence yet. And so Shelly, and she's about, I don't know, 18 months old. Uh, she toddled down without them seeing her. She followed her kitty cat down to the edge of that water. And I got this frantic phone call from my wife at work. I had just come home from work and she called me and or I had just come back to the office and she called me and she's bawling. What had happened is she missed Shelly and she looked around and she was gone. And she, Becky run up on a little high place to, to scan out and she just saw her PJs float around the corner of that canal. And Becky run down there and her and her dad and jumped in and grabbed her. And she had rolled over on her back. We'd, we were lifeguards at the time. And so we'd showed them how to, how to go under the water and come up and turn over on your back. If you don't think a little child, 18 months old, can learn that, you're, you're nuts. They come up, she rolled over on her back and she was just going down through the, the, the canal on her back. And Becky grabbed her up and she said, hi. <laughs> totally oblivious to the death that was that close to her. You got my point? My point is, as sinners, we are absolutely clueless of how close to eternal death we are. But God reached down and picked us up. Even though it was a sin in my family to go through the gate. There wasn't no gate there at that time, but, but supposing there had been, and she'd got in that same trouble, Becky wouldn't have gone down there and said, well, you little brat, you're no longer in our family. Doesn't happen that way. God loves you, even though you're a sinner. God wants you to know that his love extends to you in the form of being able to be able to have that eternal life. And so today I want to challenge you. Put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. He paid for a debt you could never uh, never pay. 
and he gave you a gift you could never earn. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the food, the, this, this food of the Spirit that we have had today, this Word of God that we have had. Thank you for loving us enough to be able to, uh, to speak through us. You're, you, you have told us that your Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, I, I pray that, that we would be able to see through faith the very power of God when it comes to to our salvation. I pray that anybody that is here today and doesn't know that would be willing to give their life even right now while there is while there is this end of this of this service that we would take the time to say thank you Lord for our salvation. And if someone does not know Jesus as their savior that they would come to know him even right now and then tell us about it. Tell all tell one of us so that we can rejoice with them. And so that they can fulfill what they're said to do, that they would put their trust and faith in Jesus Christ and that they would confess him with their mouths. And so that they would not be quiet about it, but they would tell others about that. In Jesus' name, amen.